Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're in the house of God this morning. Come on. We don't have to stay at home. Praise God. Isn't that good? Man, I'm seeing some new faces. All the way from the fro frozen north. Well, it's not frozen now. Good to see you back. I brought some friends with you. You guys from Connecticut? From local? Okay. South Carolina, man, you from God's country there, brother. <laughs> that worship leader up here, he's from South Carolina. I graduated from high school in South Carolina. Hey, I done lived everywhere, though, so that doesn't count. <laughs> Amen. Vic, who you got with you there, bro? Angela, good to see you this morning. Welcome. We got, we got some missionaries this morning. Anthony, won't you and Michelle come up for just a minute? We're going we're gonna to get into the Word in just a second, but... We always like to honor our missionaries. Anthony and Michelle are missionaries to Chi Alpha Missionaries at Virginia Tech. Why don't you just tell us a few words how everything's going? Yeah. Good to see you guys. They're on the way back from the beach. Want to stop and see us on the way home. Say amen. Well, good morning, uh, family. We're so blessed to be here. Just real quick, we, you know, coming into this year, we were called, I was telling someone this morning that. Three different pastors called us up before the semester started in August saying this is going to be an unprecedented year for Chi Alpha. That was just the word they've given us. And in semester one, we saw 50 students come to know Jesus Christ in, in semester one. And we normally see about 80 over the course of the year, but 50 in one semester. Man, God was on the move. We're like, we're living it out, the unprecedented year. And then COVID hit, right? And you're like, and it was so easy for us to begin to feel like, that was swept out from underneath us, but to watch what God did as we went virtual and as life groups continue to meet, discipleships continue to happen, services continue to happen, and people who had not really been a part of our community were finding themselves plugging into our community from a distance. And, and although our, our seniors didn't get to experience what they were hoping to experience, right? They, no one dreamed to go out that way. We just saw God's faithfulness, and God knew that they were the class that can endure the, the, that season. And we've just been so blessed to, to partner with you in ministry, and, and we've been seeing God move. We're, we're going to see a team between interns and staff of 32 staff and interns uh, this, next, this next year. And so uh, our issue is space. Um, and reservations, right? And so with working with the university, you need to have uh, reservations. And so we don't have places big enough to teach our interns and have staff meetings and prayer meetings and worship nights. And all of those things are big, uh, are a little bit more complicated in the campus ministry world. So if you think about us, pray that God would provide space for us to uh, be able to meet and conduct and train and disciple students and staff and interns We've now sent out, and I don't know if you know this, but in Columbia, we have 12 campus ministries that you've all been a part of helping us plan. We sent a team over to Radford University. Uh, we were doing that for a little while. Now we have a team up and running, and I don't go over to Radford University except when I'm invited to speak, you know. And, and now we're going to launch in December. We're sending a team to Boston uh, to, to plant Chi Alpha in uh, the city of Boston. So thank you so much. Did you want to? Say anything real quick. So we love you guys. We're so grateful for you. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Michelle. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. We are, we are joined this morning with the last count, 27 different countries uh, is live streaming with us this morning. So we're preaching and reaching out to a much larger audience. And uh, see, the devil meant the COVID-19 for evil, but God turned around and used it for good, didn't he? Amen. We're, we're reaching out to a whole lot of people, and I just pray that uh, this morning's message is going to be a blessing to uh, all of those folks. Today is the summer solstice. Many of you know what the summer solstice is. It's the longest day of the year. You have more daylight today than you have any other day of the year, and then the days start getting shorter from now until December the 21st, which is the winter solstice. And I love the summertime, man. This is my time of the year. I love it. I just, I love getting out and seeing everything. My garden is growing, man. My cabbages are like this big, and, and the birds are singing. It's just awesome. I love it. Also, just a couple of things I needed to mention that we are going to be having our annual business meeting since we couldn't have it because of the stay-at-home order. We're going to be having it on July the 12th. 
What we'll do is immediately after the service, we're going to have that meeting. It will be really short. But I have to announce that at least two Sundays in advance. But that will be three Sundays from now. But just letting you know, we're going to be doing that. <clears throat> and also, while you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, <clears throat> I've been meaning for the last several Sundays to send a special thank you. Noel and Sheena, you guys have been so faithful to cut this grass. Yes. They just do it every single week, it seems, religiously, and have been doing it for years. And, and that is just such a blessing, to see people just do things that maybe to some seem simple. But, brother, that is a, that's a blessing. Thank you. I came by the other day, and there's Sheena up on the tractor, and there's Noel with the weed eater. And thank you guys for doing that. Isn't that good? Let's give them a big hand. Come on. Now, Colossians chapter 3, if you found that uh, your place there, in verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ. How many of you in here has been raised with Christ this morning? Come on, raise your hand. If you're a Christian, you're a believer, you're a born-again child of God, you've been raised with Christ. He said, seek those things which are above where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. I yeah. love that right there. That's a guarantee that every believer is going to be with Christ when he appears in glory. We're going to be in that number, praise God. Verse 5, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Now, if, unless you were just a child that committed your life to Christ as a very young age and have lived your life for Jesus all of your life, some people have done that, I'm going to just take a wild guess that some of you probably did some of these things before you came to Christ. Amen? Amen. He said, but you've put those things to death. Verse 8 says, but now. Everybody say, but now. You yourselves are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created you. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarians, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, verse 12, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Everybody say, put on. Put on tender mercies. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If any one has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God, Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ. In verse 18, he gives an instruction now to the family specifically. He said, wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. 
Now, in Ephesians 6, Paul writes to them, and he says similar things. He says, verse 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it is a now word. It is yes and amen. Jesus, the day that you taught Paul to write these things down, God, they was for our teaching and our learning and our admonition, God. They are timeless, Lord, and they mean as much today as the day that you inspired him to write them. So, God, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit not only to be on me as I teach these things today, but, God, I pray that the anointing of the Spirit will be upon those who hear it. God, that they will realize this is something I need to apply to my life. This is something that I need to do to make me the man or woman of God that God has intended for me to be. I pray these things will happen today in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, help me today. Help us to hear now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day to everybody, all you dads out there. Father's Day is something, however, that is, has a different meaning to many different people. To some, it's easy to honor your father on Father's Day because when you think of Father's Day, you sort of get this image of a role model home. Most people do. How many of you know who Ward and June Cleaver is? The millennial says, I have absolutely no idea who you're talking about. How many of you have ever heard of Beaver Cleaver? The millennials still don't raise their hands. You're making me feel really old. Lie to me and raise your hand. <laughs> it's a, it, it is a show that came on, Beaver Cleaver. He was a little boy. Well, Ward and June was the mom and dad, and Wally was the older brother in Beaver Cleaver. And they lived in this matchbook, picturesque home where dad was wise, and he was giving them counsel, and he was raising the family, and they honored and respected their mom and dad. Little white picket fence, just a role model American home. You know, and they had, back in the day, they had things like Father Knows Best. Anybody remember that show? Yeah, Father Knows Best. How many of you seen the movie Cheaper by the Dozen? We're dad. He's got 12 kids, you know, and he's like, they're cheaper by the dozen. So, and, and they respected their dad. I, I remember a scene from a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. We watch that every year at Christmas time. It's a Wonderful Life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Hey, even the millennials raised their hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Well, in that scene, George, the young George Jefferson is helping the druggist, Mr. Gower, and Mr. Gower has just received news that his son was killed in battle, and he is, he is just out of sorts. And he puts poison in the pills that he's sending to someone, and little young George is supposed to take them. Well, he realizes what Mr. Gower's done, and he's trying to tell him, but he won't listen. And so he's wondering, what do I do? What do I do? And there's this great big poster in the store that says, Ask Dad, or Ask Your Father. And I saw that scene as I was thinking about this message this morning because there was a time where it was commonly taught and naturally expected that you respect and honor your parents, particularly your father. But there was a movement in the late 60s and early 70s. Ladies, I'm not picking on you. All right? But the women's liberation movement, they, and, and there, listen now, there was a need for that. All right, in fairness to you girls, there was a need for that. Women were oppressed. They were working jobs but wasn't getting paid or getting the recognition for the jobs that they did. And that's not right. It's not fair. Amen? Come on. Every fair-minded person should agree with that. Come on, guys. Amen? Because if a woman can do the same job as a man, she should get paid the same. All right? And there's some things women can do better than men. Come on now. And there's some things that women can't do as good as men. We're seeing it right now. It's going to wind up in the courts about transgenders being able to race with the girls. And it's a boy look, trying to act like a girl, and the, the girls can't keep up with him in a race. In fact, in Connecticut, there's a case right now. This, this athlete, she lost the state title four times to a boy trying to be a girl because he outran her in the race. And so they're bringing it to the court like they're going to put a stop to that. And so there's some things you just need to leave it alone for crying out loud. Amen? I better leave that alone. 
But some women, they didn't want fairness. They wanted revenge. And so they worked to emasculate men and manhood, and they worked to portray particularly the father as a bumbling idiot that was clueless about everything. Now, my wife picked up on that really early because we had a little set of books called Bernstein Bears that we was reading to our kids. And in every single episode, Dad was this dummy. And Mom, all wise knowing Mom, came to the rescue. And she said, I don't like what this is teaching my children. So we stopped teaching Bernstein Bears to our children because it was, it was patronizing the father to let him think he was in charge and then Mom would really be the hero in the rescue. And sometimes that is the case. Come on, guys. Sometimes Mom, she's pretty smart, amen? <laughs> and dads, come on. Sometimes we miss it. But the Bible portrays the father in a much different way. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, he said in verse 1, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate. He must be sober-minded, of a good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not covetous. Verse 4, he says, he must be one who rules his own house well. For his children, and having his children in uh, uh, submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? You see, the father designed by God was to be the manager or the ruler or the overseer of his home. He is the spiritual high priest of his home. That was God's Design for the Father. And so the world sees that differently. Paul put it this way in, in, in Ephesians 6, 4. We read that fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Yeah. Come on, Dad. It's your job to train and teach your children about God. Come on. That's not mom's job. Dad, that's your job. God has ordained you to train and teach your children about God. And so God has a different idea of what a father and the role of a father should be than the world does. And we're to put off the things of the world. We're to set our affection on things above, not on the things of this world. Not what the world says you are, Dad, but what God says you are. Come on, say amen. amen. So how do we put off those things. We're to put off anger and wrath and malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of our mouth. You don't need to be cussing at your kids, Dad. Come on. Yeah. I, I will say something here, but it'll, somebody will know who I'm talking about. I better move on. <clears throat> we need to put, we need to, we need to be temperate and sober-minded. You need to have good behavior. You need to be hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. You need to be gentle, not quarrelsome or covetous. You need to put on tender mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering. And above all that, he said to put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God rule in you. How many of you know that if a dad would do that, it would be easy to honor your father today? Amen? Come on, if I could say all those things about my dad, it would be easy to honor my dad today. But Father's Day, it means something different to a lot of different people. Because while some people see their dad like that, other people, Father's Day is a reminder of a man who had no honor, a man who was selfish. He had unrealistic expectations, a man who was impatient with his children always angry, a lazy bum that wouldn't get up off his blessed assurance and go to work and get a job but made mom do everything. I know one young lady who had to support her mom and her dad because they were both lazy bums. An absentee dad. He was never around. You didn't seem like you were important enough for him to be there for you. An immature dad. Some guys, it seems like they never grow up. They need to be responsible, take responsibility for they're out with the kids playing on the basketball court or in front of a video game. Mm-hmm. 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 
Some people, they dreaded to see their dad come home. The, uh, one of the most horrible sounds was the sound of the gravel as the car, car's coming down the driveway when dad's returning home from work. Because when he come in the door, there's always contention and strife in the house. I grew up next door to one of those guys. Every weekend without fail, he was in a constant state of inebriation. We would set, my, we thought it was funny as kids. As I grew up, it broke my heart. But we would set as entertainment to see what he was going to do this weekend. And I remember watching my five-year-old friend take his three-year-old little sister and hide her under the house with a blanket wrapped around them in the wintertime because dad's drunk again. I watched him take an oil circulator stove and rip it out of the floor and throw it out in the yard with fire still in it in a state of drunkenness. People that are abusive physically and verbally. You see, to a lot of people, that's their dad. And so when we say Father's Day, they don't get the image of June and Ward Cleaver. They did get the image of that guy. Father's Day, what does that really mean? You see, we relate to things according to our own personal experience. If you had a good home, Father's Day is a good day. It's a happy day. But what if you didn't have a home like that? What if you were the son of King Herod who killed all of his sons so that they wouldn't get his throne? <laughs> what if you were the son of Absalom? A young man who led a rebellion against his own father, King David, to try to take his throne. How would you like to say, yeah, Absalom's my dad. <laughs> I'm so proud of him. What would you, how would you like to call Ahab and Jezebel mommy and daddy? Ahab, a gutless, wimpy, whiny, spineless fraction of a man who led his wife defy everything that was holy and pure. How would you like to say, Ahab's my dad. I'm so proud of him. Oh, sure. How would you like to be Moses on Father's Day? You ever thought about that? Moses, who grew up as a prince of Egypt, he is... He's got the best of everything. And as far as he knows, the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, is his mom. I don't know at what point he realized that I am not an Egyptian. Scholars don't really know. We believe that it was somewhere around age 40. But what must have gone through his mind when he realized that the princess is not my mom. When he found out that his nanny was his mom and that his dad was Amram, a slave, can you imagine the psychological, emotional roller coaster that he must have went on when he learned this information that I am the son of Amram and Yoshebel, a Hebrew slave? I am not the prince of Egypt. I'm a slave. And the Bible says he went back to his people and he saw the oppression of his people. And he saw an Egyptian beating a, one of the Israelites and he killed the man. Just think about that for a minute. He's probably likely 40 years old. How many times has he seen an Egyptian soldier beat a Jewish slave? And it didn't bother him at all. That's what soldiers are supposed to do. They're slaves. That's the way you treat them. But now, they're not just slaves. Now, they're my people. And it didn't raise him to the point that he committed murder. Can you see the roller coaster that this guy's on? Yeah. The emotion, like one minute you're fine, the next minute you're depressed. Then you're angry and you're in a point of rage. The next point you're crying and you don't even know why. You don't know who you are. You're looking in the mirror and you see a half a man. Your building blocks of life that has made you who you are is laying shattered on the floor and you don't know how to put it back together again. 
What block do you even start with? Then there was Jephthah. Who knows who Jephthah is? <laughs> Say, I've never heard of the man. Well, Jephthah was one of the judges. See, after Moses led the people, then uh, Joshua led the people. After Joshua, you had a bunch of judges like Gideon and Samson. You've heard of those names. Deborah. Well, Jephthah was one of them. And Jephthah was the son of a prostitute. How would you like to say, my mom's a hooker, and I have no idea who my dad is? It could be anybody in Gilead. The Bible says he was the son of a prostitute, and his father was Gilead, meaning he was born by some man in Gilead. But every guy he passes on the street, is that my dad? Is that my dad? Happy Father's Day. Okay. What does that mean to Je Jephthah? who was an illegitimate offspring of some guy that just wanted to have a good time. How do you think that made him feel? Well, I'll tell you how it made him feel. The man who decided to raise him had sons, his half-brothers, and he disinherited him as an adult. So he goes out and he becomes a warrior. And other people that was outcasts became his soldiers. And he had a band of raiders that was not to be matched. And now they are facing the uh, Ammonites. And the, and the Israelite people, they don't know what to do. They can't defeat the Ammonites. Ammon, Ammon. So who is the Ammonites? They're the descendants of Ammon. Well, who is Ammon? Ammon was the son of Lot's daughter. Now, Lot, remember, Abraham had a nephew named Lot. Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that story? And because of homosexuality, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed it with fire and brimstone. And when they came out, Lot came out with his two daughters. His wife looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. Remember that story? And now Lot has got his two daughters and they're saying, well, we don't have a man. We can't have children. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to get dad drunk. And so they got dad drunk and one went in one night and one went in the next night. And they had two children, Ammon and Moab. One became the father of the Ammonites. The other one became the father of the Moabites. Okay? What was Father's Day to those guys? My dad is my grandfather because he was born of an ancestral relationship. Father's Day has a lot of different meaning. Come on, guys, to a lot of different people. And here's Jephthah, and they go to the, the, the children of Gilead and said, Jephthah, if you'll come and fight the Ammonites for us, we will make you the leader of the people. And so that's how he became a judge because he's got this pent-up rage inside of him because of who he is and what he is that made him the warrior that he became. Father's Day means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. I just read some articles. How many of you know that a lot of people today are going on to Ancestry.com and sending in their DNA and trying to find out their lineage and what percentage I am of Italian or, or English or Scottish or Irish? Or, anybody here have done that? A few people? Beware. Because what they're not telling you is one in ten people that's doing that are learning that the man they have always called daddy is not their dad. One in ten. You should read some of the stories of the people that discover that. And it's most of them are older people because the younger generation, they're like, eh, I don't care about that. Older people is kind of like, I don't know who I am, where it came from you. And so they're finding out the man I called dad all my life, not my dad. They're finding out that some of it was incest. Some of them were adopted. Some of them was a love affair that their mom had. Some of them were the product of a violent assault. And they have no idea who their father is. When Dr. Roden was here, how many of you were here when Dr. Roden? I went on sabbatical and Dr. Roden came and spoke. What I didn't know about that man, he gave his testimony. At age two, his mother and stepmother was killed in a car accident. So he's raised by his grandmother. At age 15, 
He goes to the hospital to see his grandmother because she was sick in the hospital. And when she was there, they said, well, your grandmother's on this floor and your dad, well, he asked her, first of all, he said, he said, Grandma, what is a stepdad? My mom and my stepdad died in the car. What is a stepdad? And she, she, she told him, said, well, your mom married a man and, and, and you were born. And then she divorced that man and married another man. So he's not your real father. The other man's your real father. All right, so he, he's at the hospital at age 15. They said, your grandmother's on this floor, and your real dad is on this other floor. Today, at age 15, you're going to meet your real dad. So he goes in, and he calls him Mr. Roden. And the man was very nice and all, and he said, I'm going to have a picnic. I'm going to invite you over. I'm going to let you meet your family and everything. <clears throat> and he said to a 15-year-old, that excited him. He's going to get to discover some of his roots and some of his history. But the phone call never came. That man eventually died, and at age 55 now, he's 55 years old, and his uncle, who's about to die, said, Robert, I need to tell you the truth about where you came from. The man that you met in the hospital was not your dad. He said, your real dad was a young man that worked around the farm when your mother was young, and she, he impregnated your mother and he, Dr. Roden was born just before his mother turned 15 years of age. Then she married Mr. Roden, who gave Dr. Roden his name, said that was the man that you met. But your real father died at age 30 from rheumatic fever. And so here is a 55-year-old man, and all of a sudden, all the building blocks of his life that had been knocked down and he rebuilt has been knocked down again. And it's laying shattered on the floor, and Father's Day just took on a whole new meaning to this 55-year-old doctorate in theology man. And I remember him giving the testimony of, of how that just upset him so much. <clears throat> he never knew his father, never had the opportunity to know him. He finally learned that he had two half-sisters, and he met them, and they've actually built a relationship. But here's the thing. Dr. Roden planted West End Assembly of God Church in Richmond, which is to this day the largest and most successful church in the city of Richmond. He planted five other churches that have also grown to be very large and successful churches there. He became the district superintendent of one of the most active and, and, and involved uh, uh, districts in the Assemblies of God, the Potomac District Superintendent. So you're not, listen, it doesn't matter what your pedigree is. Wasn't that a good cartoon? It doesn't matter what your pedigree is. That doesn't define who you are. Moses was one of the greatest men of God in Scripture, and he was raised by a pagan idol worshiper. Pharaoh's daughter worshiped Isis and other pagan gods. Hebrews eleven twenty four says, For by faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 says, But you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Do not lie to yourselves. You put off the old man with his deeds. You put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge according to the image. Now, I want you to get this. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. According to the image of him who created him. How was Moses able to sort all of that out? build the blocks back up, and take on the man that he became. He didn't look at who my real father was. He was a slave. He didn't look at Pharaoh's daughter who raised him. He looked and got the knowledge of him who created him. In his mind, he saw the image of him who created him. Now, I want you to go back to Hebrews 11. <clears throat> He says, for Moses, verse 24, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ a greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked for the reward. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured 
as seeing him who is invisible. How did he overcome his patronage? His parentage. Did I say that right? Parentage. How did he overcome that? He didn't look at where he came from. He looked at who created him. And he fixed his eyes on the one who created him. And he tried to be like him. Why would he give up everything? What, he wanted to be just like dad? No, dad was a slave. He may have been a good man, but he was a slave. See, this like father, like son, every man in here, listen to me, you're not like your dad. I don't know where that saying came up from, but that's just not true. You're not like your dad. Your dad wasn't like his dad, and his dad wasn't like him. That is rarely the case. Few men in Scripture was like their father because some of them were better than their dad. Some of them were worse. You take Josiah, for example. My grandson, my firstborn grandson's name is Josiah. Great name. I'm glad they picked that name for him. He began to rule Egypt as, the, as uh, the Judah, Egypt. <laughs> he became the king of Judah at age eight, ruled for 31 years. His grandfather, Hezekiah, was a godly man. He did what was right in the eyes of God. But his boy, <laughs> Hezekiah's boy, his son, was Manasseh. Manasseh built temples to pagan gods all over Judah and caused the people to err. Was he like his father? Absolutely not. His son, Amon, Amon, he was a whiny little wimp. He wouldn't tear down the temples, and he wouldn't turn people to God. He just kind of let things go as they went. And two years later, he was assassinated. And then his eight-year-old son, Josiah, came in to be the king. 300 years before Josiah was born, an unnamed prophet went to Re uh, Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, if you remember, King David had a son named Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom was split. The northern kingdom of Israel was ruled by, what, by Jeroboam, this general. The southern kingdom of, of Judah was ruled by Rehoboam, Solomon's son. So, Jeroboam, this guy, okay, Jeroboam, he built high places. In other words, under trees, they, they built altars and stuff for pagan worship. They still do that to this day. People dancing around with oak leaves on their heads. It's, it's Wicca and different kinds of demonic, satanic worship. That's what they were doing. And they had built an offer, and this, uh, this unnamed prophet came up, and he began to prophesy to the altar. He said, altar, altar. There will be a man born by the name of Josiah. This is 300 years before he's born. And he will burn the bones of the men who worship and, and, and serve the priests that serve you. Their bones will be burnt up on you. And as a token that this is the word of God, you will be split in two and your ashes will be poured off. And all of a sudden... The altar split in half, the ashes poured off, and Jeroboam pointed at the man and said, Arrest him. And the Bible says that his hand withered so that he could not draw it back to him. And he cried out to the man of God and said, Pray that God will heal my hand that I can draw it back to me. And it's another story, another whole sermon, but I'm going to just stop there. 300 years before Josiah was born, that prophecy came to pass. And when Josiah was born, he tore down all of the altars. And when he went to that altar, he saw those graves over there. And he said, dig up their bones and burn them on the altar yeah. and fulfill that prophecy. Then he saw the altar of the, unborn, of the unnamed prophet and another prophet. He said, whose are they? They told him whose it was. said, leave those two alone. But all the other graves, they dug them up, took their bones out and burned it on the altar. He was the grandson of Manasseh, one of the most evil men in, in, Jew, in Jewish history. Come on, you're not like your dad. You're not like your dad. Your dad may have been good. Your dad may have been bad. But you're not like your dad. What am I saying? It doesn't matter who or what your father was. 
doesn't matter what he did or what he did not do. Doesn't matter if he was good. Doesn't matter if he was bad. Doesn't matter if you know him. If you don't know him. Let me tell you something. Your dad is going to answer for everything he did, everything he didn't do, whatever he was, whatever he was not, your dad will answer for that. But what you need to see today and what is important is to know that you will stand alone and answer for what you will be or will not be, what you will do or will not do. You will answer for that. And if you had a great father, then you are very, very blessed. Amen? And you should honor him. But Father's Day, for a lot of people, is a painful reminder of a man that had no honor. It's not a day filled with happy memories. Now, church, as I was preparing this message, I want you to listen to me. Are you still with me? Say amen. There have been few times in my ministry that God impressed upon me a scripture to tell you. To the degree and with the intensity in which God impressed upon me and said, read this scripture to those people that are hurting today because Father's Day is not a happy day for them. Isaiah 61, it says this, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them, church, I'm giving you something this morning, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Would you stand with me, please? In closing, men, I want to say something to you. I don't care how old you are. You may be a little guy this big. You may be somebody that's past my age. And I'm older than dirt. Men, you're called to be fathers. Every one of you. A lot of people say, well, I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to be a father. My dad was a, he was a mess. Well, I didn't even know my dad. Or, see, there's all kinds of definitions of what a dad is. And a lot of people, they don't know how to be a dad. I was raised by Charles Clifton Newcomb, who didn't know how to be a father. He was one of 10 children. Now, some of my family may be listening, and if this hurts, then it's just going to hurt. But my dad committed his life to Christ, and he was the only one in his family that did that at that point in time. Later on, a few of his family, his, his siblings, you know, they, they made a profession of faith. Whether they committed their life to Christ or not, I can't say. That's not for me to judge. When we moved to back to Virginia for the first time, I didn't know anything about that side of the family, so I went hunting with my oldest uncle, the eldest son, and he let me in on some history of that family. My grandfather made moonshine on the farm, and he was a drunk. That was my dad's father. That was his role model of a father. So he didn't know how to be a father. 
He learned how to be a father in the house of God from men of God. You say, well, I don't have any children. Yes, you do. That man's children are your children. That man's children, they're your children. Teach him how to be a father if he doesn't know how. Teach him how to be a father. Some of you listening this morning, you say, I'm all, it's too late. I'm a failure. You're one of those guys that I described. You were angry or you were you know, impatient. You had unrealistic expectations and all those things. You just blew it. Philippians 3.12 says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Jesus Christ has already laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forward towards those things which are ahead. I press toward the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. What am I saying to you? Start right now. Start right now. Forget those things. Yes, maybe you did blow it. Maybe you were a failure. Forgive yourself. Ask God to forgive you. Ask your kids to forgive you and press on. But don't wallow in your failure. Forget those things that's behind you. That's behind you. You can't change that. But you can certainly make a difference beginning today. This is what God told me to tell you, failure. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Make good of it. Every day is a treasure. It's a blessing. Put off the old man. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Be the dad that you should have been. Start now. Young fathers, we are blessed to have a lot of young fathers in our church. This is what God told me to tell you. You have a clean canvas. Paint the picture of what a godly father should look like. So that on Father's Day, your children can celebrate that I had a good dad. He was a godly dad. You have an instruction manual. Learn it. Teach it to your children. Practice it. Then there are those this morning, this is a painful time for you. We're standing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head if you would, please. Maybe your dad was that guy that was selfish, unrealistic expectations. He was impatient. He was angry. Maybe he was a lazy bum, or maybe he was an absentee dad. You just feel like you weren't important enough to him and have time with you. You know, my dad, I was an extraordinary Little League baseball player. My dad never saw me throw the first baseball. That can mess with you guys. But as an adult, I look back, I said, well, my dad was working a full-time job raising three kids. My mom was having all kinds of emotional issues. He was having to deal with that. He bought two houses and put himself through Bible college to earn a master's degree in theology. When did he have time to play games? Come on, you got to cut dad some slack sometimes. Your dad might have been immature. He played games. He never grew up. You dreaded to see him home. Your dad may have been a contentious, contentious and strifle, constant state of inebriation, had an addiction behavior. Maybe he was abusive physically, verbally. Like Moses, your building blocks are scattered everywhere. What do I do with all of that? Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one another forgiving one another. 
If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Guys, if you're going to build your life into something beautiful, something good, the first building block that you need to establish is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, there's some things that people do that you can excuse. In fact, if you knew some of the history of why they did it, there may be a reason for that. Just like with my dad. I'm like, I examine why he didn't come to my ball games. I'm like, my goodness, the man was working. He was this. When did he have time for games? That's excusable. So you know what I did? I just forgot about it. Okay. Dad didn't have time for that. I, that's excusable. But then there are some things that there is no excuse for it. But they are acceptable. They're not like the end of the world. It's like, well, I think you could have done better. But, you know, I can accept that. You were weak. You were whatever. Some things are acceptable. But there are some things that's not excusable, some things that are not acceptable. But church, listen to me. Everything is forgivable. Amen. Amen. Forgiveness is something you choose to do. Got nothing to do with how you feel, whether it's right or wrong. It's something you choose to do. And if you're ever going to be healed in your heart so that Father's Day is not a painful thing for you, but it's something that you can obey the Scriptures and honor your Father, even if he was worthless, even if he was Ahab or Herod or whomever. You've got to find that place to forgive because you will never be healed if you don't forgive them. The Bible says just like Jesus forgave us, he hung on a cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Come on, your dad didn't know what he was doing. He was in the world. He acted and did and thought like the world. Come on, if he was in Christ, he wouldn't be acting like that. Amen? Because when you're in Christ, you put off the old man, you put on the new man. So forgive him. And if you will do that, I promise you, God will begin to heal in you. So whatever you do, whether it's good or whether it's bad, listen, your dad may have been a good man. What does that have to do with you? You're not your dad. Just because your dad was good doesn't mean you're good. Now, we see that throughout history. Some men were good. Their children were terrible. Some men were bad. Your dad was bad. He was a bum. What has that got to do with you? You're not your dad. You're not just like your father. It's not like father, like son. You are who you are. Girls, this doesn't just apply to the men. Because a little girl, come on, a little girl needs the affection and the affirmation of her dad. And this morning, listen, we're standing in the presence of the Spirit of God, and he wants to heal something in your heart. The Internet world, some of you are listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's people crying right now because their heart's broken because they needed their father. They needed that affirmation. Girls that needed to be told by their dad, you're beautiful, you're smart, you're valuable. And because they didn't find it there, they went seeking it in other places, and they found it in the wrong way in the wrong place. And it was dad's fault because he wasn't the father he should have been. And God wants to heal that in you this morning. And he will heal it if you will just let him. What you choose to do in spite of or for the sake of what has happened to you is what defines you. Everybody look this way. I wanted you to close your eyes because I wanted you to think about what I'm saying. What your dad did, what has happened to you, whether it was good or bad, that doesn't define you. What you choose to do in spite of that or for the sake of that is what defines you.
Now, Dr. Roden did something when he was here. He said, I'm going to ask everybody just to raise your hands like this. He said, the Quakers used to do that. Would you just raise your hands with me like this? Everyone in the, everyone in the room, just raise your hands. And will you just say, God, I receive everything that you have given me today. I receive it. Then they would take their hands and they would do like this. I want you to do your hands like this. Say, now God, I lay all my burdens at your feet. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray a supernatural healing takes place right now in the hearts of those that are hurting. God, those that their world has been just taken apart. And they don't know who they are, God. They're struggling to try to find their identity because we associate so much of our identity and our history and our heritage and our lineage, God. Father, there's people here this morning that they got pedigrees like Jesus that could trace his lineage all the way back to Adam. And there's people that have pedigree, God, and they, they identify in their pedigree. But God, show them today that our life is not in that pedigree. Our life is in you. Moses' pedigree, he found out what it was. He was the son of a slave, but his identity wasn't in that. It wasn't in he was raised in Pharaoh's home. It wasn't in that. His identity was in the knowledge of the one who created him. God, may we realize today that, Father, we are what you make us. God, you have a purpose and a plan for every single person here. God, help us to find that. There's not a person here. You may feel like I'm not worthy for God to use me. Yes, you are. Because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you came from. There's nobody in this room any better than anybody else. Let me tell you something. The, the ground is level at the cross. There's no big me and little you at the feet of Jesus. We're all the same. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus wants to make a difference in you. Would you put off the old man this morning and put on the new? I'm going to ask you, if you're here this morning and you would like to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you before I close. Anybody here that needs Jesus Christ to come in and change their heart? For the benefit of those outside, we're 27 different countries is listening to us this morning, church. Do you realize that? There's a lot of hurting people right now that need to hear this. And wherever you are, whoever you are, Jesus Christ wants to come right there where you are and change you. Would you just pray with me for their benefit? Would you do this? Say, dear God, I come before you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me for all the wrong that I have done. I lay that at your feet. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life and make me a new creation. And I will serve you, Jesus, the rest of my life. In your precious name, I ask these things. Amen, amen. Father. As we close this morning, Lord, I pray a blessing over every single person, God, under the sound of my voice, Lord, that, God, you will be their constant help in their time of need, God. You will be their refuge and their strength, their tower, God. Father, I pray a blessing over the body of Christ, Lord. I pray a blessing over their home. May it be a refuge, an escape from the world, a place where you are honored, Lord. God, their home may be a well-sealed brick house. God, it may just be a hut. God, it may be a, a, the, the shadow of a tree limb. But wherever their home is, God, may it be a, a sacred place for them, Lord, a place where you're honored, a place where your Holy Spirit is welcome. God, I pray that you strengthen the family today, husbands and their wives, parents and their children, 
siblings one with each other. I pray a special blessing over those who are alone and single today, God, that's seeking their mate. Father, may you guide that one special person to them, Lord, that they can be joined in holy matrimony and walk together, God, through the life that you planned for them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for being here this morning. Love you. Amen. Amen.